I'm Wenzel Jones. And I'm Laura Dickinson-Turner. With News Wrap, a summary of some of the news interaffecting LGBTQ communities around the world for the week ending April 13th, 2019. U.S. President Donald Trump tweeted in July 2017 that transgender recruits should not be allowed to serve in the nation's armed forces. Even as challenges to the ban continue to be argued in federal courts, Trump finally got what he wanted this week. The last of four injunctions preventing the implementation of the ban fell in mid-March, and the Pentagon then announced that the new policy would become effective on April 12th. While Defense Department officials steadfastly insist that it's not a ban, a transgender person under the new policy can now only serve if they pretend they're not. All enlistees must now serve in their birth gender and can't transition while serving. Current transgender troops have, in some cases, been on active duty since the Obama administration lifted obstacles to their service in 2016. The Palm Center studies LGBTQ people in the U.S. military. Their research says that some 14,700 qualified and honorably serving transgender military personnel will be kicked out under the new policy unless they agree to serve as the gender they were assigned at birth. According to the Palm Center, less than 1,000 who've already transitioned or are in the process will qualify to continue serving under what are called grandfather exemptions, which could be revoked at any time. Palm Center director Aaron Belkin wrote the book on the rise and fall of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. He compared that policy to the newly instituted trans ban on MSNBC's The Rachel Maddow Show. This is Don't Ask, Don't Tell for transgender troops, and uh, the Trump administration is claiming that this is just an innocuous policy. It won't harm the troops, but that's what we were told at the beginning of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and we saw how well that worked out. This policy will fail in the same way that Don't Ask, Don't Tell failed, because um, the public won't tolerate a policy that uh, hurts the troops um, uh, indefinitely. But we can't predict now whether the collapse of the policy will be in court or in Congress, where there's now bipartisan legislation to protect the troops, or perhaps if the White House changes hands. But there's just no way to predict right now um, how this ban will crumble. Virtually every U.S. medical and mental health association has rebutted Trump's claims that health care costs for trans troops would be tremendous. And before the arrival of Donald Trump, the Pentagon's own study had concluded that trans troops were not disruptive and were not causing a morale problem, as the president has claimed. The transgender military memo was signed by Acting Deputy Secretary of Defense David L. Norquist. It prohibits service members who exhibit gender dysphoria, the condition of experiencing a distressing clash between one's experienced gender and the gender assigned at birth. As BuzzFeed's Dominic Holden writes, gender dysphoria is, for many, the essence of being transgender. The U.S. military has been the country's largest single employer of transgender people, until now, of course. Qualified transgender people are welcome to serve in the armed forces of Australia, Austria, Belgium, Bolivia, Canada, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Israel, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, and under some circumstances in Cuba and Thailand. A court in Russia has ruled that a printing company illegally fired a trans woman in 2017 who had worked there for more than 10 years before she started to identify as a woman. The company told the Frunzensky District Court in St. Petersburg that Anna Grigorieva was fired under a 19-year-old Russian government policy that bars women from working in more than 450 jobs deemed too dangerous or arduous for women. The United Nations said in a 2016 declaration that the policy violates women's rights. The district court ordered the printing company to give Grigorieva her job back to pay her the equivalent of about $150 U.S. in damages and about $25,000 in back pay. Her lawyer, Maxim Olenichev of the queer rights group Coming Out, announced that for the first time in Russia, a transgender person has managed to defend her labor rights in court. He said the landmark ruling should inspire other trans people to fight for their employment rights. Ksenia Mikhailova, another lawyer for coming out, said the off-limits jobs are meant to ensure women's ability to conceive and give birth. She added that Grigorieva's court victory was not only a historic decision for trans people, but also for women who don't want children. The Australian state of Tasmania has become one of the most progressive places on earth for transgender people. 
Its parliament passed sweeping legislation to protect them on April 10th by a vote of 13 to 12, even though the governing Liberal Party opposed it as legally untested and highly problematic. Speaker Sue Hickey joined opposition Labour and Green MPs to pass it. The legislation removes the requirement for surgery before a person aged 16 or older can change the gender designation on their birth certificate, and instead allows a simple declaration to make the change. The new laws also allow people to remove gender markers from birth certificates if they so choose, and allows parents the right to choose whether or not to include a gender marker on their child's birth certificate. The legislation bans hate speech and offensive language based on gender identity or expression, or based on intersex status. The new laws also end the requirement for married transgender partners to divorce before they can change the gender on their birth certificate. Tasmanian Families for Transgender Kids spokesperson Candace Harrington said that parents of transgender and gender diverse kids are just so happy that our kids will no longer face legal discrimination and will be able to live their lives true to themselves. We are over the moon about these landmark reforms. In other news, the Cayman Islands Court of Appeal shut down the planned wedding on April 10th of successful lesbian litigants Chantelle Day and Vicki Baden-Bush. The appeals court bowed to the government's request after it filed its challenge to issue a stay to prevent Chief Justice Anthony Smella's grand court marriage equality ruling from taking effect. Two days before the stay was issued, hundreds of LGBTQ people and their supporters in the capital of Georgetown held a first-ever Cayman Islands Out of Our Shells Pride March. The peaceful and colorful procession ended at the steps of the Legislative Assembly, where lawmakers had applauded the announcement that the government would be appealing the marriage equality ruling. The event was organized by Colors Cayman, the island's queer advocacy group. Their statement said that, We are proud to acknowledge our existence and hold our heads high. No longer will we be made invisible. The Court of Appeal will hear the government's challenge to the marriage equality ruling in August. The boycott of Brunei has now been joined by the English National Ballet, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, Tempest Magazine, Citigroup, Barclays, Goldman Sachs, Jeffries, Nomura, Britain's Foreign Secretary, and the Police Federation of England and Wales. They add to the growing list of companies, celebrities, and governments that are shunning the tiny, Muslim-majority East Asian nation. It's all in response to the institution of severe Sharia, or Islamic law, by its ruling sultan. Sharia punishes consensual adult same-gender sex, adultery by Muslims, and other so-called crimes with death by stoning. The family of Sultan Hassanal Bolkiah owns several high-end hotel properties, including the Dorchester in London and the Beverly Hills Hotel in California. You can see the entire list at thiswayout.org. Australian media this week identified Brisbane's Royal on the Park as another of the Sultan's hotels. According to the travel industry publication TTR Weekly, subsidiaries of the Sultan's companies own hotel properties in Bali and Singapore as well. TripAdvisor deleted reviews for the Sultan's hotels on its platform following a spike in negative posts. Trivago, Expedia US, Expedia UK, Orbitz, and Travelocity have been condemned for continuing to take bookings for them. The Sultan also has a financial stake in Royal Brunei Airlines. Street demonstrations outside Brunei government offices have been held in London, Brisbane, and Bangkok, and more are expected. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison was the latest this week to join the global chorus of condemnation, while U.S. President Donald Trump and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have been conspicuously silent. And finally, you may recall A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo, an illustrated children's book published last year by TV political humorist John Oliver. It parodied a children's book by the family of U.S. Vice President Mike Pence about their real-life pet rabbit. Oliver's Last Week Tonight staff writer, Jill Twiss, actually penned the book in which Marlon meets and marries his male bunny boyfriend. A very Mike Pence-like stink bug is the villain of the story. According to the latest list from the American Library Association, or ALA, A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo was last year's second most challenged book. A majority of the top 10 books that were banned or moved to obscure library bookshelves had LGBTQ themes. The book most objected to was George, an award-winning coming-of-age story of a transgender girl by Alex Gino. Two of the children's books on the ALA's most censored list were notoriously burned outside the local public library in Orange City, Iowa last year by a far-right Christian preacher to protest the area's first LGBTQ pride event. 
The library received more than 200 queer-themed books and monetary donations in response. In this week's media release about the most banned books, the ALA made mention of that book burning with a quote by famed English poet and essayist John Milton. He who destroys a good book kills reason itself. That's News Wrap, global queer news with attitude, for the week ending April 13th, 2019. Follow the news in your area and around the world. An informed community is a strong community. News Wrap is written by Greg Gordon, produced with Brian DeShazer, recorded at the studios of KPFK Los Angeles, and brought to you by you. Help keep us in ears around the world at the ever-updating thiswayout.org, where you can also read the text of this newscast. And now you can be the first on your block to hear News Wrap each week by subscribing to our This Way Out Radio YouTube channel. For This Way Out, I'm Wenzel Jones. And I'm Laura Dickinson-Turner. <laughs>